Good morning, everyone. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, mutations, um, somatic mutations in cancer, uh, the idea of drivers versus passengers, um, oncogenic events, loss of function events, just like we talked about yesterday for copy number variations. Uh, we're going to talk about mutation classes and rates, uh, as well as signatures. Uh, and we'll see some examples of somatic mutations uh, that have clinical rele relevance. Um, and then in the second part of the talk, we'll talk about some statistical considerations uh, for modeling uh, variant allele frequencies uh, from next-gen sequencing data, and, as well as some analytic approaches that um, we'll go over kind of the basics in this lecture, and then you guys will have a chance to, to tackle in the lab. Um, and finally, how to just a brief overview of how, how you might want to interpret some of your mutations. Okay, so yesterday we discussed this idea that cancer is a, an evolutionary process and, uh, um, you know, it conforms to the rules of Darwinian selection. So today I just wanted to add uh, a couple of more definitions, specifically that uh, cancers arise as a result of driver mutations. So there are these initiating events. And it's thought that it takes between two to eight mutations um, on average to initiate a tumor. So here we see uh, this green cell that became a black cell. It took uh, at least two to six, uh, or two to eight mutations to get there. And so this process can happen over many years. Um, in pediatric cancers, uh, we don't see that many driver mutations, but there are probably other epigenetic events and so on that, that help to drive those tumors. Uh, but in adult tumors, that's, that's the ballpark number. And so these provide a selective growth advantage, and then we see other mutations crop up, which are important in maintenance of the tumor. Um, and we have this, um, this uh, heterogeneity within the tumor where some clones have a preferential growth advantage. And then after selective pressure, uh, like chemotherapy and treatment, uh, we see that a uh, subset of um, clones uh, result in progression of the tumor. And often, and what you know, next-gen sequencing data and really deep um, genomic analysis has uh, let us understand in the past few years is that these clones that give rise to mutations are often present up front. So there is this big diversity of mutations in the primary tumor because mutations are occurring all the time with every cell division. Um, and they, they may look like passenger mutations that have no selective advantage in the primary tumor, but in the right context, they're going to give those cells um, uh, an advantage. Um, so somatic point mutations, I'm sure you guys actually know quite a bit about this already, but we'll just go over the basics. Uh, so this is a... This is p53. It's a tumor suppressor gene. Um, genetic defects allow cells in this gene to evade programmed cell death and DNA repair. And so these are small changes. Yeah, one question. Ah, OK. So <laughs> um, I will try to speak. Let me take another sip of coffee. <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, these are in contrast to yesterday where we looked at events that are hundreds to thousands of base pairs long, uh, these are typically very small events, so one base pair or just a few base pairs for indels. Uh, so you can see here that for somatic events, these are changes that happen only in the germ or, or only in the somatic, uh, so in the tumor uh, cells and not in the germline of the individual. Uh, there are three main classes of mutations um, in the coding regions of genes. These include missense mutations, so these are single base substitutions that alter the amino acid of a protein. Um, and often these occur in the first or the second position of a codon, which is a group of three bases that are recognized by the cellular machinery as a unit. And each codon is matched with a unique amino acid during translation, so during mRNA translation. Um, there are also silent or synonymous mutations, which often occur in this third position of a codon where there's a lot of redundancy because there are many more codons. There are 64 codons and, I think, 20 amino acids. So many codons encode the same amino acid, and basically this third base is, um, uh, is redundant. So um, if they do not change the protein, these are termed silent mutations, and they don't have a functional impact. And then we also have these nonsense or truncating mutations that introduce a premature stop codon in the protein. Uh, and they essentially truncate it and can um, um, affect its function. 
And then another class of mutations are small insertions and deletions. Um, so here we see the, the normal sequence of a, of a um, mRNA and, or yes, of an mRNA. And when you have a, an insertion of either one or two base pairs, you change the reading frame. So a different amino acid is, is now going to be encoded at that position. And not only at that position, but every following position. So you're basically putting the rest of the protein out of frame when you introduce uh, an indel of one or two. When you introduce an insertion or a deletion of, um, of length three, then you're just adding or deleting one individual amino acid. Um, just a note, accurate detection of indels is actually pretty tricky. Uh, and next-gen um, sequencing um, has a number of biases that, that makes this challenging. And so it's an ongoing computational challenge to um, accurately predict uh, indels, as you will see later today. Uh, so just like copy number alterations, uh, mutations um, or indels have typical patterns of frequencies that differ between tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. Uh, so here we're looking at four genes. The top two are oncogenes. And you can see that each one of these little glyphs, these little symbols, uh, represents a missense or a truncating mutation in a specific tumor. And you can see that for the oncogenes, uh, most of the mutations are focused uh, in specific spots. So these are important domains, uh, for instance, in PI, uh, PI3K. Uh, the helicase and the kinase domain. So when you see this pattern of hotspot mutations, that's a really good indication that there's positive selection for this mutation. And these mu missense mutations typically change the amino acid of the protein. Um, and so the new version of the protein has a gain of function or, alter or switch or al alteration of function. Um, and often, these kinds of uh, changes cause a protein to be constitutionally active. So they, you would no longer need signaling from upstream uh, molecules in order to activate this protein. It's just active um, uh, without this additional input. Um, and the second, uh, um, the second pattern is uh, genes that show this loss of function pattern. So these mutations shown in red are missense, and the ones on the bottom shown in black are uh, truncating mu mutations. And these change um, the protein in such a way as to reduce its function. So for instance, by preventing binding to um, obligate partners, um, or by truncating and shortening the protein. Um, so you can see that the distribution of, of these is, throughout, is, is spread throughout the gene. So there are many, many ways to inactivate something or break something, and there are just a few ways to activate something. So that's, those are the two main patterns of mutations that we see distributing um, across these two groups of, of types of genes. Um, so consortium projects like the TCGA um, have aimed to sequence thousands of tumors, large cohorts, uh, in an unbiased way, uh, and find all the mutations in tumor suppressors and oncogenes. Uh, and the goal is to find what events cause phenotypic attributes or, or those hallmarks of cancers, so that we could perhaps explain how these hallmarks are acquired. Uh, and so we'll just take a quick look at a summary from one of these studies. Uh, so this is a synthesis analysis from, um, of the mutational landscape of tumors. Um, uh, from tumors of many types. So we see the types of tumors here on the bottom, from many tissues of origin, um, and in patients across different age ranges. So in general, it looks like there are about 120 genes uh, to 140 genes in total that have driver mutations that have been defined in this way. Um, and we'll look at a couple of them just as, as a closer examples in a minute. But in any given tumor, like I said, there are between two to eight acquired driver genes. Um, that change the phenotype of a normal cell to a malignant cell progressively with acquis acquisition of each mutation. Uh, but these are not the only mutations in the tumor, like I said. Typically, there are, there are between 33 and 66 genes with protein coding changes. So a big challenge uh, is to tell apart which are the drivers from the passengers. Um, there are some outliers in this range. Uh, these mostly include melanomas and lung cancers. So these are cancers um, whose etiology involves really potent mut mutagens. So they have hundreds of mutations instead of tens. Um, and they're only really outmutated uh, by tumors with defects in DNA repair, which can accumulate thousands of somatic events. <clears throat> and then at the other end of the scale, we have these pediatric tumors that typically have very few alterations. Um, and then a final point is it, it looks like mutations in tumor suppressor genes uh, predominate. Uh, 
over oncogenic activating mutations. Um, so that has clinical uh, implications because, um, as we talked about yesterday, it's, it's a lot easier to target oncogenes and disrupt their function, and it's a lot more difficult to add function back to, uh, to genes that have lost it. Uh, but, you know, synthetic lethal approaches like the BRCA, PARP, uh, dual inhibition is one way to get around that. Uh, so these studies show that by far the most frequently mutated gene in cancer is p53. Uh, so this gene is involved in regulating programmed cell death and DNA repair. Um, and if there are significant genomic abnormalities in a cell, p53 will prevent the cell from completing the cell cycle and cause cell death. Um, so it's a built-in safety system, and so mutations in this gene allow cells to survive despite acquiring massive genomic rearrangements um, and mutations um, and are able to proceed through the cell cycle. And often in many tumors, this is an early event, uh, but in some tumor classes, this is an event that happens later on once the genome is starting to become more, um, more unstable and to accumulate a lot of changes. Um, so this is a view from C-BioPortal. I think you guys will have a chance to go over C-BioPortal in some detail in uh, one of the, um, um, in one of the labs. Um, but basically, it's a repository of data from TCGA and big uh, consortium efforts. And it's data that has been processed and analyzed. So if you're interested, if you have a favorite gene and you'd like to know what its distribution of mutations or alterations is in cancer, uh, this is a really good resource for that. So the, the URL is down here on the right. Um, but basically, it shows the frequency of p53 mutations uh, in this plot across many types of cancer profiled by, by TCGA. So you can see that uh, almost every cancer of certain types have mutations in this gene. And then there are some cancers that um, uh, have a lower frequency of mutations in this gene. But I encourage you, if you uh, ever need corroborating data for your uh, experiments, to look and see BioPortal. Um, so the other 120 to 140 genes uh, mentioned as drivers um, and mutated significantly more than expected by chance. Uh, these genes are shown here as rows, and they're kind of organized based on their involvement in a wide range of cellular processes, um, which are kind of broadly classified in about 20 categories, like transcription factors and regulators, uh, histone modifiers, genome integrity, receptor ty tyrosine kinase signaling, cell cycle, and so on. Um, the types of cancer that have been profiled are the columns. So one thing you can see is that some genes are mutated across many different cancer types, uh, and here's p53 with the strongest pattern for that. Um, so that is really one of the most frequently mutated genes in cancers. Uh, whenever we sequence some tumor and we look at what's mutated in this tumor, inevitably we find p53. So it's not very exciting in a way, but also it's not very surprising, so it's good because it makes sense of tumor biology. Um, this is the VHL gene. It's only mutated in kidney cancers, so there's something tissue-specific and kind of exquisitely context-relevant uh, about this gene that makes it oncogenic in just this tumor type. Uh, we see KRAS, highly mutated in colorectal cancers. Um, and PI3K, again, exhibits mutations across many different kinds of tumor types. Um, and APC, again, exquisitely specific to colorectal cancers. Um, so there are many cellular and, and enzymatic processes involved in tumorigenesis. Um, and a lot of these we knew about before, uh, like MAP3, uh, uh, like MAP, the MAPK uh, pathway, PI3K, wind signaling. Uh, but a lot of these ha represent new categories that weren't appreciated as being highly mutated in cancer. So things like splicing or transcriptional regulators uh, or metabolism uh, and histones. So these are kind of opportunities for um, uh, developing new therapies. And these mutational themes would not really have been obvious without an unbiased and large survey of cancer data. So that's really the power of these kinds of studies. So there's a lot of clinical utility in terms of knowing the status uh, of mutations in particular genes, um, because some mutations define a cancer. Uh, so for instance, p53 mutations are expected to be in every case of serous ovarian cancer. If you don't see a p53 mutation in those tumors, it's very likely that there's been a misdiagnosis. Uh, so in some cases, mutations are diagnostic. Uh, just like the BCR able translocation in CML, it's not only diagnostic, but um, every patient that has that translocation can be treated with Gleevec. 
Um, so there's lots of companion diagnostics uh, emerging for therapeutics. Um, the most common are probably for EGFR mutations in lung cancers. Um, for melanomas, there are uh, specific dust for mutations in BRAF. Um, mutations in KRAS in colorectal cancers are used as a counterindication for a specific drug because we know those patients will not respond. So you can use mutations to assess response as well as uh, a lack of response. Um, and mutations are also emerging as markers of drug resistance. Uh, so for um, so secondary mutations in EGFR indicate resistance for um, anti-EGFR therapy. So those patients that are undergoing therapy and have this um, specific T7090M mutation, you know those patients will recur and you need a second-line therapy ready uh, for when they do. Uh, so just a couple of examples. Uh, this was an important discovery in gliomas, IDH1. This is a metabolism gene. So people kept seeing mutations in this gene, and it was really hard to interpret. Uh, it's a recurrent mutation, um, and it was very difficult to say how this was a driver event. Um, and finally, people have really kind of figured out the mechanism, which is based on a gain of function in, this, in the mutant protein, which generates a very rare metabolite. Um, and that metabolite accumulates in cells and is a competitive inhibitor of histone demethylases. So the effect in gliomas is that these mutations uh, increase levels of histone methylation, uh, especially repressive marks. So that causes a block in differentiation. So we see these um, epigenetic effects as a result of this mutation in a metabolism gene, which is not at all a, an intuitive uh, um, interpretation of, of the mutation data, but that's what turned out to be um, the effect. So it turns out that IDH1 play a big role in tumorigenesis, and now there's a lot of research activity devoted to studying this process and how we can interfere with it. Uh, here's another example, FOXL2 mutations. Uh, this is from Sorab Shah's lab. And this came from studying a really rare form of ovarian cancer. Uh, and in this case, they performed RNA-seq. And noticed in their first case um, um, that there was a particular mutation um, at, in this gene. And then they saw that mutation in every other patient that they sequenced. So this is a gene that's a transcription factor responsible for differentiation. So mutating this gene um, does not allow the cells to differentiate. Um, and it's, it's actually the causative event in this disease. So that's called a pathognomonic event. So that's a mutation that defines the disease. So it's very diagnostic. And it's important for rare cancers to have a diagnostic event like this because sometimes they're very hard to diagnose and then you don't necessarily know what the treatment should be. Uh, so this, this is more of a problem for rare cancers. Um, PA3K we talked about, um, but I wanted to bring it up again because I wanted to show you a pathway diagram. So how many people are familiar with pathway diagrams? Maybe just under half. So um, the PI3K pathway, I, I'll just point out a couple of things. So each one of these boxes uh, uh, encoding um, the name of a gene represents that protein. Uh, and each arrow represents a direct interaction. Um, you could see that in some cases there are tiny little plus P, that means that there's a phosphorylation event, which is part of the interaction, or minus P, which means there's a dephosphorylation event. Uh, these dotted arrows are um, indirect interactions, and these lines that end in a, uh, in a perpendicular line are um, inhibitory interactions. So you can see that mutating a gene at the top of this big cascade uh, would have a big effect, right? Because it's at the top. So it's going to affect every downstream, um, every one of these downstream members. Um, primarily, PI3K would activate AKT by inducing um, phosphorylation of this molecule, this PIP2 to PIP3. Um, so we often see activations, active, the hotspot mutations in PI3K allow it to, um, <clears throat> to kind of engage and, um, and uh, undergo this, this conversion process uh, without input from its upstream regulators. So it decouples it from the upstream regulators. Uh, P10 is the gene that blocks this process, so that dephosphorylates this, this, um, pro this uh, metabolite. And so we often see deletions in P10, right? So these are very um, 
mutations that are very powerful because they are really high up this, uh, this hierarchy and they will affect many downstream events. Uh, if you see mutations... You know, if you see a mutation in one of these genes, it's less likely to be a driver because its effect will not be as, uh, as wide as mutations higher up the hierarchy. Um, oh, and the other thing was mutations in genes that act in the opposite way, like inhibitors and promoters of a pathway activation, will often be mutually exclusive. So that's the other test. If you see mutually exclusive uh, mutations in a cohort of patients, that's evidence that they, they are working in the same, to kind of affect the same pathway. So this table basically summarizes some of the important mutations that are currently being tested for, uh, for which there are targeted agents, and for which clinicians can prescribe a therapy. Uh, so we've talked about most of these, and in the next slide, we're just going to see an example of uh, the clinical relevance of the BRAF inhibitors. So specifically the V600E mutation in melanoma. So melanoma, uh, so melanoma patients, about half of them carry this particular mutation. Um, amino acid 600 um, is changed from a V to an E. Um, and that leads to constitutive activation of downstream signaling through the MAPK pathway. So 90% of these mutations um, are in that particular um, um, uh, amino acid. And... Um, there's an inhibitor of this, um, of this form of BRAF called vemurafenib. So the top graph shows patient tumor response to vemurafenib versus <clears throat> the, the classic therapy uh, or the standard therapy for these uh, tumors. And so what you see on the Y scale is growth in the positive or shrinkage of the tumor. So you can see how many patients respond to the classic therapy versus how many patients respond to this targeted therapy. And it was a really a big, dramatic improvement. And so people were very excited when this came out, um, that now you could use vemurafenib for each tumor that had a V600E mutation. And so um, people were excited to use it for colon cancer, which also has a BRAF mutation at this particular position. Um, it's about 10% of colon cancers that would be expected to respond. And what these plots show is that compared to control um, and the standard of care uh, for, for, these, um, for these colon cancer patients, femurafenib, which is the PLX li line in this case, uh, made no difference, even though these patients are uh, mutant. And that's because colorectal cancer cells have an activated EGFR pathway. So that completely bypasses the signaling uh, that you're blocking uh, using BRAF. And in melanoma cells, where this therapy worked really well, there is no EGFR activation. So that's why it works so well in that, um, um, in, in that tumor type. And so this group proposed that a dual inhibition of BRAF and EGFR would actually work well. And that's exactly what they saw. So, so this line at the bottom is uh, shrinkage of the tumor or lack of growth of tumors um, that have dual inhibition. So just the presence of the mutation alone uh, is not sufficient to predict response uh, without the cellular context. So the cellular context actually plays, plays a big role. And here's just one last example. Uh, this is a, a more recent discovery of mutations in the regulatory regions of genes. So um, we've talked a lot about coding mutations, driver mutations that alter function. Uh, but specifically in melanoma, in um, sporadic tumors as well as familial tumors, um, so there are two studies came out, I think, the same issue of science. Um, so these two groups studied melanoma-prone uh, families as well as um, uh, sporadic cases. And through linkage analysis and high-throughput sequencing, they found uh, a mutation that segregated in the germlines of these families. Um, and it was in the promoter of a gene, so the TERT gene. This is the, encodes the catalytic subunit of telomerase. So this mutation creates a new binding site for a transcription factor, the ETS transcription factor, and it basically causes a big increase in expression of TERT. Um, in sporadic melanomas, these mutations are recurrent. They're found in 85% of metastatic tumors, uh, in 33% of primary melanomas. And so somatic mutations in regulatory regions are actually something that is really relevant to cancer and a bit understudied because... Uh, there was a big focus on exome sequencing for a long time. And now as whole genome sequencing is get, getting cheaper, we can actually start to um, you know, look in more detail and more systematically uh, at characterizing effects in regulatory regions. Okay, so 
Uh, we talked about events in single genes. What about patterns of mutations across the genome? Uh, what can they tell us about the biology of mutations? And there's one property uh, that we haven't really talked about, which is uh, uh, which are um, mutational signatures. So that tells us something about the processes or the mutagenic influences that are causing uh, mutations in a cancer genome. How many people have heard of mutational signatures? Maybe, maybe half. Okay, so a great way to think about this is to consider the patterns of mutations. Uh, so this figure is from a, um, a pan-cancer report, and it shows from the center to the outside the abundance of mutations in each tumor. So here's the why. It's a kind of a non-intuitive but really interesting plot uh, where you have mutations per megabase and going from the center to the outside from 1, 10, 100, and so on. Um, and each dot represents an individual tumor. And around this donut or circle, you can see the types of mutations that uh, can accrue. So C to T mutations, C to A mutations, uh, different kinds of changes. Uh, so these black dots, uh, I know you, you guys don't see the exact same color, but in your printout you would. So these black dots are mel melanoma tumors. Um, and these are not only characterized by a very large number of mutations on average in each tumor, uh, but they also have a, this preponderance of C to T mutations. Um, so does anyone know what would cause this? Yeah, sunlight, UV, UV radiation. So this is the pattern that you always see uh, when your mutagen is UV radiation. So it's a signature for that mutagen. Um, so this process involves deamination of cytosines and creates a C to T mutation across the genome. Uh, and it's specific to melanomas. Um, the red dots are lung cancers, and we see these typical C to A mutations. Uh, so a similar type of thing is happening there. I'm sure you guys can... Yeah, smoking. So tobacco exposure is, uh, is this particular um, uh, signature. And so these are examples of exogenous factors that can reveal what mutational insult has happened to these cells at one point. There are endogenous factors as well. Um, and, and so you can classify these substitution patterns or represent them um, as these so-called mutational signatures. So I'm showing you here just the first six signatures. Uh, but basically... Each mutation is analyzed or considered in the context of the base before and the base afterwards, so the, the upstream and downstream base. Um, so these bars show the frequency of C to T mutation um, in the context of, you know, how different they are in the context of a preceding and a downstream base that is different. And you can see that there is a big difference, um, and the context does matter. So considering this upstream and downstream base generates this list of 96 different trinucleotide combinations. Uh, so there are 96 uh, possible mutation types. Uh, and we have about 30 signatures um, at this point. Uh, these have been derived from an analysis of these, um, of the frequency of these 96 um, uh, uh, mutational, uh, um, sig not signatures, but trinucleotides. Um, across many thousands of patients from about 40 different kinds of cancers. Uh, so this, this is a study from the TCGA. So each signature um, has with, with it, when you look it up, it has the associated cancer type in which it was found, in which it's prevalent, um, the proposed etiology for that mutational signature, if it's known. Um, a lot of them are still unknown. Um, and any other mutational features that might be known about it. Yeah? Can I ask something? Yeah. So what would you use uh, if you have like uh, your own data and you want to see like what kind of signature you are getting, or whatever? Right? What what would you use like for like this? So there yes, there are packages to um, where you can input your um, mutation data from your tumors. Um, and have a prediction of the mutational signatures and a p-value for their enrichment and so on. And we will have an example of that in the lab. Um, yeah. Why there's only six possible pictures given? <laughs> ah, good question. So, so the question is, why are there only six possible cases here? Uh, so C to T. Um, so there are two parts to that question, I think. One is, why isn't there a G to A, right? So the G to A is just the opposite strand of this. Um, and so all the reverse complement events 
are redundant, and so the list is collapsed from 12 to 6. Um, and then within the C to T, you would see the, the different contexts. So that red bar is kind of zooming into the C to T, and you see, uh, you, you would see that if your C is following an A, and right before another C, you are much more likely to have this, um, this mutation. Um, and reducing the redundancy really helps because we're already at 96. So um, instead of doubling that and having redundant information, it's just um, it's a good way to simplify. Um, so here are some lung adenocarcinomas and some melanomas. And this is the kind of output you would get from one of these mutation signature calling uh, algorithms where for each tumor that you're considering, which is each one of these bars, you would have... Uh, you would have the contribution of each signature towards the mutations. So many of these mutations are, um, belong to or correspond to signature 7. And there's only one tumor where you see a preponderance of signature 11. Uh, but you can see that in every tumor, there are, there are more than one mutational process is happening. Um, and so uh, when you're comparing between different uh, cancer types, you can see these big dramatic differences. Uh, but e even within patients of the same cancer type, you would, you would potentially see differences. L lung and melanoma are these sort of really, like they're just driven by, by UV and smoking. Uh, there are other tumors that are, don't have a single um, mutational uh, driver like this. Uh, this is the kind of information you can get from the uh, cosmic site um, for these signatures. So here's signature four, you get these you get um, the cancer types uh, where this has been found. Uh, the proposed etiology, this is associated with smoking. It's um, what, are, what are similar patterns? Um, what are the mutagens uh, that are likely? And any additional mutational features, um, which we've already talked about. So when you do this, you would, uh, when you run mutational signature analysis on your samples, you would then go to Cosmic and kind of browse the list of what are, what are your top hits. Um, so I encourage you to explore Cosmic as a resource for reading about these different signatures. So considering all the different kinds of cancers that have been profiled um, and all the 30 signatures, it's pretty obvious that some mutational processes are widely distributed and found across tumor types, and others, as we've seen, are just relatively specific to particular malignancies. So, um, uh, and some are only found or have only been observed in one cancer. So do you guys think that this is the complete list of signatures? No. There's been, um, and how would we find more? You could see more types of cancers. Yeah. types of cancers, more types of rare cancers um, would reveal additional rare types of mutational insults that could, that could um, perturb, perturb the genome in a, in a way that can be detected with this type of analysis. So I think recently there was a, a big paper, uh, there's a Nature paper describing a big cohort of pediatric tumors, and they found a new uh, signature, or they proposed a new signature, and it really, it's because um, TCGA does not really have a lot of pediatric cases, right? So different mutational processes uh, are going to be observed um, at different stages of life. Um, there are also uh, potentially clinically relevant. Um, this is an example from the Personalized Oncogenomics Project uh, run at the BC Cancer Agency. So uh, patients are admitted to this kind of personalized uh, sequencing and analysis of their tumor genomes once they've gone through a lot of therapy and have failed and basically have no other options. Uh, so at the time in uh, um, POG was in its uh, first version where they were just taking these highly treated patients. Uh, and so this patient had an abdominal tumor of unknown type. Uh, she had three rounds of unsuccessful treatment, was out of options, was enrolled. Her tumor was uh, sequenced, and an analysis of mutational signatures were, were done. And her abdominal tumor had the classic signature of a breast cancer, um, which is not something that you would ever treat an abdominal tumor for. You would never treat with uh, with uh, with therapies that that would be predicted to work only for uh, for breast cancer, and it turned out that this was a rare case of a tumor arising on the milk line, which I never knew about before, but it makes perfect sense. So this is the the ridge uh, 
of developing. Um, this is the ridge along which I think in embryonic week seven, so between seven and eight, this ridge develops in all mammals. And that's before sexual differentiation, so before embryos become male or female, which is why male, males have nipples, and many, uh, even though they don't have functional mammary glands. Um, so, and then this, the development of these cells uh, regresses and they disappear, except for the ones that, uh, that become uh, nipples and mammary glands. And so some people who have third nipples, the third nipples develop along this line. Um, but in her case, uh, some of those cells persisted and became a breast tumor in her abdomen. So once they figured that out, they treated her with a, a breast cancer therapy and she responded and she's tumor free. So it can have really insightful clinical applications in, in uh, certain cases. Okay, so some statistical considerations uh, for analyzing allelic distributions from next-gen sequencing cancer data. How do we detect mutations? Um, let's first revisit the properties of cancer genomes uh, that we need to account for when performing mutation calls. Um, so we're interested in those mutations that are not in the germline of an individual uh, oftentimes, although there are predisposing mutations. Um, tumor DNA, the, the, but for somatic uh, mutation analysis, you would like to be free of normal cell contamination. Uh, and as we know, that's not really possible because tumors are often admixed with normal cells. So this is... Um, this is a property of cancer genomes that we need to account for because it dilutes our biological signals. There's also this intratumoral heterogeneity, which is that cancer is this mosaic of cellular populations that will have different mutations. Uh, so we need to account for that when we consider uh, the frequency of mutations. Um, there's genomic instability, like we talked about yesterday. So copy number events will change the observed allelic fraction uh, of mutations. Um, and so when you're analyzing uh, mutations, it's best to do it knowing copy number. So it's best to do copy number and mutation analysis in parallel. Um, and the ideal experimental design is to sequence both uh, tumor and normal samples from the same patient. Um, so this is the flowchart for what an analysis might look like. So we start with a cohort of interest that's sequenced. Um, and the first step is to align the reads to the genome, uh, just like we did yesterday. Um, uh, there are uh, numerous tools for doing that, and we'll talk about that in a second. These alignments are then um, input to one or two or more of these mutation calling tools, um, as well as tools for detecting copy number, um, uh, so you can have a copy number status at each position in the genome, and the purity and the ploidy of each tumor. Um, so now we would have variant allele frequencies for candidate somatic mutations, and we would want to annotate these with gene information, filter out germline events, uh, filter out common polymorphisms in the population, and then be left with a short list of interesting events that we would want to follow up on. So these interesting variants, um, we would want to, uh, for, for these uh, variants, we want to transform the variant allele frequencies so the observed ratio of reads that support the mutation versus that support the wild type, we want to transform these into uh, something called the cancer cell fraction, CCF. So we're going to talk about that um, uh, in a bit more detail because we're going to go in the next few slides through each of these steps. And then we'll stratify mutations into clonal and subclonal uh, and perform some further interpretation. So first up, our alignments. Um, there are many tools for aligning. I think the take-home message from yesterday was BWAMM was the best, maybe marginally the best. Uh, but basically, all these tools take in your reads, align them to the genome, and try to infer where there are any differences. Uh, so we won't go over alignment um, in this module, but the idea is that we reduce the sequence read data to just a set of allelic counts, counts that support the mutations versus the wild type at every position of interest. Um, and the position of interest are those that um, are different as well as those uh, from the reference, as well as those that are uh, somatic. So conceptually, the way we do this is uh, that we have the normal genome and the tumor genome, and we count the number of reads covering each position and how many of those reads correspond to the reference sequence, which is shown up here in green, versus how many uh, correspond to an alternate allele. So um, 
in this particular case, these blue bars represent uh, bases that are, uh, so this is a heterozygous position. Out of seven reads, we see three bases that support a C, and the reference is a G. But in the tumor, we also see three out of eight bases that support a C. So it's heterozygous, AB, AB, in both uh, normal and tumor. And same with this position. We see that uh, it's, I think it's a G to a C. So we see basically zero Gs out of seven and zero Gs out of seven. So it's BB, BB. Just like we talked about, that's the minor allele. Uh, but in this case, we see a homozygous uh, A in the normal, and then we see a heterozygous uh, AC in the tumor. So this would be the somatic mutation that we're interested in. Um, and Can I ask you a yeah. So new ones, the germline variants, uh, are they SNPs in that person? They might be. So you would, if you are interested in those variants, although if you're looking for somatic events, you would not be because they're germline. So there's no difference between the germline and the somatic. Uh, So you wouldn't think it's a driver necessarily, uh, especially or probably in adult in an adult tumor. Um, so that's why you need to have the Yes. So here you're just looking for those variants that are different, uh, that are that are specific to the tumor and not found in the normal. So you would not be able to do this analysis without the normal, and without that individual's normal because every person is going to be different. That's at like 3 million positions at least. Um, and so um, basically there's a statistical component to then interpreting these ratios and assigning a probability that uh, an event is somatic given the um, allele frequencies in the normal and the tumor. So this is kind of the way the uh, mutation calling uh, strategies work. Um, there are a number of artifacts that are going to generate false positive mutation calls. Uh, so it's really important to visualize your data. Uh, but some of the art artifacts that could occur are, um, can be caused by a different number of things. Here we see this T instead of an A. Any idea what could be causing this artifact? You can see that the T has poor quality because the intensity of the color uh, fades. Yeah, exactly. There's a long, long stretch of uh, homopolymer stretch of T's, and Illumina sequencing kind of has uh, the tendency, after a long homopolymer stretch, to just add one more of those instead of the next base. So it often makes errors uh, like this, so substitution errors. Um, this is another example. This is an indel. So here we're seeing, you guys have gone over IGV, so here we see the reads. The gray reads are ones that uh, have a decent mapping quality. These black bars indicate where the aligner has decided that there is um, a gap. So that read uh, aligns, and then it jumps, and so there is a deletion relative to the reference, and then it keeps aligning. Um, and often, at sites with indels, there is misalignment. So what you can see is that some reads, for some reads, the aligner decided, oh, I'm going to introduce this gap, and that will be a better alignment than not introducing a gap. Uh, but often for reads where the end is pretty close, and you don't have a lot of sequence that would anchor the read to the other side of the gap, uh, it decides instead to just keep aligning the read and introduce mismatches. And that's because it assigns different penalties. Uh, it assigns a higher penalty to introducing a gap than to introducing uh, single mismatches. And so that's how the math works out around indels. And you can get these clusters of SNPs around indels that if you were to uh, assemble this region, uh, and so many tools have a local reassembly around indels and these positions of clustered mutations to kind of resolve this problem. And then you do um, a mutation and indel calling after that uh, reassembly step. And you can see it even here, down here. This is kind of what the pattern looks like. These two reads, this one up here and this one down here, have the gap introduced. Uh, and then the reads that don't have the same pattern of uh, mismatches. Um, here's a case where we see a few reads that have uh, low base quality. So sequencers, the sequencers do make errors. We talked about errors. Oh, I think we just talked about errors kind of um, 
after the lab at some point. But basically, when you have this, your, you know, each sequencing cycle adds on a new uh, base, so you're sequencing by synthesis. Um, and so hopefully, in your whole cluster on the Illumina flow cell that contains a thousand templates, you're adding the same base and you see the same fluorescence. If your cycles become out of sync, then you're going to see messed up signal. So you'll see the combination of a C and a T. Uh, and if something becomes stronger, then you, then you have a poor quality base call because the sequencer is not quite sure of the um, specificity of, of the signal. Um, and it can detect in many cases. So this position is probably just low quality uh, for a number of reads. Um, here's an example where all the reads that support the mutation come from the same strand. So if you look at forward versus reverse, with blue being reverse, you can see this, this, uh, this pileup of, of Cs uh, that you don't see in any of the reads on the opposite strand. So, so there are definitely strand-specific events. Um, on the flow cell, you know, you have, especially in GC-rich templates, you can have secondary structures form. Um, and so when the polymerase tries to go through them, um, it can impede the progress of the polymerase or it can cause it to make mistakes. So there are some context, sequence context-dependent uh, mistakes that polymerases make. Um, and often those are strand-specific. Um, here's an example of a true positive. Uh, you can see even when we uh, color by strand or when we don't color by strand, there's a strong signal for this T. There are no um, low base quality bases. Uh, forward and reverse reads both support the variant. The variant is supported by reads where it's in the middle as well as, well as reads where it's at the end. Uh, here's another example of a true positive. This, uh, this event actually validated. Um, it's very rare. There's only one read that supports it, but it validated. So this is a very subclonal event, but nonetheless a, a real somatic event in this tumor. Um, are there two Yes, there's another one here. Although this one is probably not used in the mutation calling because it's the last base, or it's actually the first base of a read. So it may or may not be used. Often. First base. The first base of the read would actually be used. It would be better, than the last one. It would be better. yeah. It would have higher uh, uh, sequence or base qualities. Um, you can also get this like low frequency, high quality errors uh, or high quality calls that are errors if there was, uh, for instance, um, uh, an, a PCR induced error when you're amplifying your library. So you may not see you know, poor base qualities or whatever, but it could still nonetheless be an artifact. Uh, so it's important to validate mutations because um, they could be real despite you thinking they're not. Uh, it could be hard to sequence through region um, and the base qualities are low. So it's really important to look at your data and then validate what you think is, uh, is promising. Did you have a question? Um, sorry. Uh, so when we do do you filter out reads before aligning based on base quality? Um, the aligner has a number of parameters uh, with default filters for what reads uh, would make it in, in the alignment, um, which you can change. Usually, uh, if it's a yeah, if it's a read which is just all T's and low, ba and low base qualities, that's not going to align anywhere. Um, I've run mutation or I've run alignments uh, with different tools. With some by default, it, all the reads show up in your final uh, BAM. Um, and with others, any reads that are excluded for certain reasons don't show up. So it depends how you want to run your alignments, if you want to preserve all reads or not. Uh, but regardless of what, of what you do, when you run mutation calling, only certain reads are, um, are used for the analysis. Yes? So how would you validate that mutation? Uh, with Sanger sequencing. Okay. So if you think this was a, an important mutation or a driver event or something you wanted to follow up on, you could use, a, you basically have to use a different sequencing technology to prove that uh, you've validated it. So if you're going to publish this, reviewers will ask you, 
can you use another sequencing technology? So Sanger sequencing is like a gold standard uh, method for that. Mike? How much do duplicate reads still like, uh, PCR amplification? So if you see only two reads that support something, but they both have the exact same start and position. Yeah. So the question's about duplicate reads. So uh, because of PCR amplification. So, you know, often for mutation calling, you remove duplicate reads first. Um, because that can skew your uh, interpretation of the variant allele frequencies. So there's a step in the mutation calling uh, tools to remove duplicate reads. Um, for RNA-seq data, that's still done, even though by chance you could have the same fragment because your mRNA is only so long, and when you fragment it, and you have, like, for highly expressed genes, possibly thousands of copies. So by chance, you could get a, a fragment that's the same start and end, which is how you call duplicate reads. It has the, you know, the first read starts at the same, uh, and, the, and the second read start at the same point as uh, another read pair. Um, so in RNA-seq data, you still, you still remove duplicate reads, but it uh, definitely makes sense, and you should do that for, for all genomes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. So for subclonal mutation detection, um, certain tools are more sensitive uh, than others. So if your goal was to detect subclonal mutations, uh, and we'll go over that in a little bit when we talk about mutation callers, um, you, you know, not every tool is going to be good at that. Some tools are more specific and are less sensitive. Um, and some tools are more sensitive but have more false positives. So you'd have to make a decision based on your particular interest for your samples, what tool to use. But we'll have some recommendations. Any more questions? Okay, that concludes our examples. So now we've done this step of aligning uh, and uh, SNV calling. Um, ideally, one is doing an copy number analysis on the data as well in parallel. For somatic mutation calling and visualization, there are many, many tools out there. Um, we'll talk about some of the ones that are more commonly used and that are pretty specific and sensitive. Um, one of the tools you'll use for a lot of analysis is SAMTools, which you've already used. Um, so it's a suite of tools, essentially, for working with alignments, but uh, it's also possible to, um, to call uh, mutations. So you guys have done mPileUp, samples mPileUp in the lab, and that basically gave you the output of, at this particular position, I count this many uh, reads with the reference allele and this many reads with the um, alternate allele, and these are all their base qualities. And that's the information that would then go into the next step of mutation calling using SAM tools. Uh, so that's one approach, but it's not very specific. Uh, GATK, um, the Genome Analysis Toolkit from the Broad Institute, is another good suite, suite of tools. Um, it's a Java implementation, and it has some important properties, um, including local realignment of indels. So uh, that resolves a lot of the false pos positives that would come up from, let's say, SAM tools and pile up. Uh, so it, it significantly improves misalignments, and um, uh, you can do quality control on your input data. You could call a germline and somatic variants. Um, you can annotate the variant effect. Uh, so if it's protein changing, non-protein non changing, if the effect is, uh, is damaging and so on. Uh, so you can read about it in a, a bit more uh, detail here. Um, Mutect is what you guys will use in a lab. So this is a somatic variant caller, uh, part of GATK. Um, this has been used for a lot of TCGA data, uh, and it's probably one of the most popular tools. Um, it, counts for, it accounts for various sources of error. So um, you input tumor and normal uh, sequencing data, and it, it performs this variant detection statistic while accounting for whether the um, uh, mutation you're interested in is next to a gap, just like we saw, uh, where there are often um, uh, misalignments. It accounts for strand bias, so it assigns p-values to um, the presence of, you know, a proximal gap. It assigns a p-value to whether there is strand bias or not. Um, 
it looks at whether there's poor mapping, whether the mutation call is always uh, in a clustered position, so like a certain distance from the end of a read. Um, it has various thresholds for having observed this um, mutations in control samples. Um, and it also handles triallelic sites, right? So we've talked about biallelic sites where you have a reference in an alternate. Sometimes you see a third base. Um, and you have the option as well of using a panel of normal samples. Uh, so some sequencing artifacts are going to be obvious when you have a big set of samples, but they may not be obvious in your set of controls. Um, and so when you, when you use a panel of normals, certain variants go away because they're observed recurrently in panels of normals. Um, and so that can be a good way to filter out um, additional artifacts. And then it does this variant classification step where it annotates your... Um, yes? Question. So for the panel of normals, is that a finding for um, you know, regional things? If you're always sequencing tumors from Western Canada, there's some sort of like genetic bottleneck that affects that population differentially? Or so the panel, when does the, uh, so the question for the recording is when the panel of normals uh, provides the most benefit, um, is it when you would have a population from a specific region that maybe share variants? Um, so the idea is that, you know, sequencers might make mistakes at some rate. Uh, and because you only sequence 10 t tumors and 10 normals, um, maybe that those sequencing errors happened to some degree in a couple of your tumors, but none of your normals by chance. And by including this additional panel of normals, you have a chance to observe that same type of mutation. Uh, maybe it's a specific location or sequence dependent thing that at some rate you're going to see um, a, an event at, which is actually an artifact. So the panel of normals allows you to correct for that. Getting to your, you know, your population question, um, you would want to be careful about using a panel of normals if you thought, for instance, that the things you might be interested in could be germline events. In, uh, so you wouldn't use, for instance, the normals of some other patients that had cancer because that TERT mutation that is somatic in your tumor could actually be a germline predisposing event in another patient. So you would ideally use a panel of actual normals, not just the matched normals from patients with disease, but actually people that are normal and are disease-free. Um, so you have to be careful about how, do you, how you choose your panel of normals. And ideally, you'd want to match technology as much as possible because the goal is to remove these technology-induced biases. So, uh, so yes, so then... Um, Mutech does some dbSNP annotations, and then you get your list of candidate mutations. Um, the attractive uh, part of using Mutech is that it has sensitivity to low-frequency mutations. So when you're looking for subclonal events, this would be a tool you'd want to use. So what you can see here is that uh, in function of tumor sample sequencing depth, you have different uh, power or sensitivity to detect various mutations. So if your mutation is at a frequency of 0.4, uh, you can detect it in a tumor where you have 20 reads coverage. If your mutation is at a frequency of uh, 5%, then uh, your sensitivity is, you know, just over 50% when you have 60x coverage. So coverage and sensitivity to detect mutations uh, is really... Uh, there, there's a big relationship between those two. Uh, and Mutect has better curves for this uh, sensitivity than other colors. So that is one of the selling features, if you will. Um, Mutect and now Mutect 2 both do this well. Mutect 2 also calls indels. Um, so it used to be if you were using Mutect, not Mutect 2, you also had to run an independent indel caller. Uh, but now Mutect 2 will call mutations and indels. So it's kind of a good suite for, for calling both types of variants. Um, another tool that is quite popular is Strelka. This is from Illumina. Um, it's named after the first Russian dogs in space, a canine cosmonaut, this one. Um, so it's a collar that generates both mut uh, mutations, SNVs and indels, uh, and it's known for having highly specific predictions. So it's not going to generate as many calls as Mutect, uh, and it's not as sensitive, but a very high proportion of these calls are going to validate. Uh, so it's very stringent in, in what it calls. 
Um, and part of the reasons it's more successful than other tools at calling in DELs is this, um, is this step uh, where it performs realignment. So it performs local realignment uh, at positions where it detects um, that there could be indels or where there are clusters of mutations. Um, Yes, exactly. So when you have an indel and your aligner has decided that it's less uh, costly in terms of uh, penalization to just introduce um, a bunch of mismatches, then um, this tool will perform local realignment of those reads to try to, to decrease the mismatches um, and basically not penalizing um, insertions or deletions as much. Um, mutation call information is encoded in this somewhat standardized format called VCF, the Variant Calling Format, um, which you're going to learn uh, uh, more about in the lab. Um, there's a benefit to having a standardized format, um, which is that, uh, you know, anyone could use uh, more, uh, like any of these tools I just mentioned, and have a fairly consistent output in terms of structure and information. So. VCF encodes a lot of metrics about the data that can be used to then filter or, or prioritize mutations. Uh, and each line in a VCF file corresponds to a mutation. Um, so they always start with chromosome, um, the position um, of the variant, uh, the start and the end. Sorry, the writing is so tiny. You guys are going to go through a, um, a more detailed version of this. Um, usually, it's the chromosome, the position, and then some sort of annotation. In this case, this VCF file has been annotated, and this is a, an identifier for, for a SNP. So this is a known SNP. Um, the reference allele, the alternate allele, the quality. The quality is going to differ for every caller because they each have their own way to assess um, the quality of, that of the mutation call based on different metrics. The, uh, sometimes um, uh, mutation callers will uh, assign a a filter uh, um, status, so whether the mutation passes some set of thresholds or it fails for whatever reason, and then it tells you the reason. Um, and then there's this um, info field, uh, which is always starts with the annotation of what you're going to, it's, it's co colon delimited. Uh, and this part of the info field tells you what each one of the values that you're going to see in the last column means, so genotype. And at the header of this file um, is going to tell you in detail what GT stands for, so genotype, um, you know, depth, DP, and so on. So you, you see that this variant, one out of one, uh, is homozygous. This one, zero out of one, is heterozygous, and so on and so forth. So you can, we're going to explore this format in the lab, but basically, there are many features about the data uh, that are useful in um, uh, interpreting your variants. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, one of the most important things you can do is to have uh, a look at your mutation calls, at least a subset of your mutation calls, to kind of get a feel for your data. Um, OK, so now that we have variants, we need to annotate them so that we can focus on those that are likely functional uh, and of interest. And I just want to talk. Um, a little bit about mutations versus polymorphisms here. Um, how many people know the difference between SNPs and SNVs? I guess it's up here. <laughs> yes? Do I answer? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, there. I know. I should have asked this question before I put up the slide. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, so polymorphisms are common mutations present in the population, right? Uh, it turns out it depends, you know, some populations differ, and so some SNPs are more common in some populations than others, but basically uh, there's a threshold of, this is kind of a rule of thumb um, of 1% of the population. Um, if variants are deleterious to fitness, they would be against, selected against, so they would be rare in the germlines of individuals. Uh, if they're advantageous for whatever reason, they would be selected for and they would become more prevalent in that population. Um, some polymorphisms are associated with disease susceptibility, uh, with drug responses, and so on. And so um, there's been a big effort to uh, kind of collect information on polymorphisms in, in different populations. And then single nucleotide variants are infrequent, potentially harmful, uh, and usually associated with disease. 
Um, and the frequency threshold we use to separate these two things is about 1%, although that can be um, argued. Um, and if you see germline occurrence of uh, some of these SNVs, um, those are often um, associated with disease predisposition. So mutations in p53 are very rare in the germline, but if you have them, then those kids get uh, Lee from any syndrome. Uh, people with germline mutations in patch one um, develop Gorlin syndrome. So these are deleterious and rare events. Rare SNVs are usually heterozygous. It's very, very, very rare to see two rare heterozygous people who have survived with their predisposition to whatever actually have a child who is then homozygous and have that be viable. Um, so most of these are going to be heterozygous. So most of the predisposition alleles are heterozygous. And often a pattern you see which kind of supports their role in disease development is that the second hit in tumors uh, in these people uh, basically results in, you know, copy neutral LOH or a, uh, a second hit in that same gene. So um, this is one of the projects that's collected this kind of data. Um, on average, we now know from, from these studies. Uh, so you know, people from around the world have volunteered, normal people, uh, anonymized, uh, have volunteered uh, for, for these kinds of genotyping um, assays. And I mean, I, I don't want to spend time and go through this in detail, but you know, there are variants that are shared across all continents. Um, some continents um, specific to that population or, spe or specific to that population or specific to the continent. Anyway, so you can kind of see the distribution. Many people share the same events, but then there are population-specific events that are going to differ for the different populations around the world. Um, each person carries about 250 to 300 loss of function variants and annotated genes. Uh, and 50 to 100 variants previously implicated inherited disorders. So having one of these variants doesn't mean you're going to have this disease. It just means that you have one of these variants. But um, there's a lot more than just having a variant uh, involved in disease, right? So there are other things that are going to affect penetrance and so on and so forth. So there are lots of these events that are non-functional. Uh, and we can also estimate the rate of de novo mutations, which is about 0.1 to 1 mutation per cell cycle. Um, and then this plot just shows the distribution of how many events are specific to each population, so with African populations having the most variety of, um, of mutations or of, of polymorphisms. This has also been commercialized. Uh, some of us talked about 23andMe yesterday. Uh, basically, you can pay $200 unless you catch a sale. Um, and 23andMe, you, you collect saliva in a tube that they send you. Uh, and then you send it off to the company, they extract DNA, and they, um, they basically perform um, a, a SNP chip analysis. So it's a, it's a microarray. I think at the moment they profile about 600,000 positions. So they have a custom chip. They used to use the, one of the Illumina geno genotyping arrays. But um, they will provide information on your ancestry. So they can put you into one of those populations. Um, they provide you reports on various wellness uh, uh, traits. So, you know, for me it was I'm a fast coffee metabolizer. Uh, for others, it's whether you have curly hair or not, freckles, lo lots of just regular phenotype um, information. They also provide information on genetic health risks. So, given your population or the risk of a particular disease in your population, uh, on that genetic background, you have an increased or decreased risk of developing this particular disease. Uh, so, they provide this kind of information. They also collect uh, lots of personal information through surveys. So, they collect everyone's genotype and then uh, you know, whether you've ever been diagnosed with whatever. So you have the chance to fill out a whole bunch of surveys. So they actually have genotyping data on about 2 million people and deep phenotypic data on a big subset of those. So they do use this data for research. Uh, so they found new risk um, loci for, I think, Parkinson's and depression uh, and other traits. So they mine this data for, uh, uh, for information. Um, they provide to you your ancestry, uh, various things about uh, your traits, like I mentioned, this 
example person is genetically predisposed to weigh 9% less than average. Um, they also provide you the raw data. So if you're interested or if you ever did 23andMe, you could download your raw data and then run all the analysis we did yesterday in the lab and figure out your copy number and, uh, and uh, uh, BAF state across your genome. So all this, all this data about polymorphisms is collected in uh, databases. So dbSNP is something you're going to use. Um, it accepts submissions for any organism from a wide variety of sources, including individual research laboratories. Um, where's my mouse? Here. Um, collaborative polymorphism discovery efforts, large-scale genome sequencing centers, and other databases and private businesses. Um, so lots of information goes into this. They do have a curation process. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is um, to threshold or to use their high-quality calls, which come from population resequencing efforts, like 1,000 genomes. Um, currently, dbSNP 150, this is, uh, I believe, the current version, has about 130 million SNPs with a known frequency um, in the human population. Up to 8% of those may be false positives uh, due to related sequences, so paralogs. So, you know, some investigators are interested in a specific region and they'll design primers that amplify that region and then screen cohorts of patients. And it turns out those primers cross hybridize to a paralogous region in the genome. So, it's not a mutation, it's not a SNP as much as uh, a, a false positive. Um, there's also a version of dbSNP called uh, non flagged. So, the flagged SNPs, so at some point dbSNP became contaminated because anyone can submit entries to it and it's supposed to be uh, polymorphisms from normal individuals, uh, but people did submit polymorphisms found in individuals who developed disease or cancer. And so it became contaminated, so then there was a big effort to flag those SNPs that are associated with some clinical feature. Uh, or that have a really low, low uh, and rare frequency in the population. Um, and so this non-flagged version is what you should strive to use if you're uh, going to use dbSNP to filter out events not of interest, because you don't want to filter out events that are associated with, with disease. Um, a note on HG38, it does not have yet the non-flagged dbSNP version. So lots of people, there's lots of resources for HG19, if you're going to undertake a study and, you know, you've got your reference genome set, uh, you want to do a bunch of work and you want to use dbSNP non-flagged, um, it's not available yet for HG38. So it will become at some point. Uh, whenever we go up a version in, uh, in the reference genome, all these other resources have to catch up. So we are still a little bit in the tail end of the catch-up phase. So something to consider when designing your experiments. Um, another database of variants. These are variants associated with, with, uh, with disease. It's cosmic, so I encourage you to uh, look at the site, especially the cancer gene census. This is something else you would want to annotate your variants with if they've been previously implicated in cancer. Uh, and so in cosmic, you could go to this website and explore it. But for instance, here's what you would see for BRCA2. Uh, it's a familial breast cancer, ovarian cancer predisposition gene. It's involved in the hallmarks of cancer, specifically these two, and they're kind of uh, detailed here, genome instability and mutations, escaping program cell death. Um, you know, you have a link to the papers that support uh, those associations. It tells you, it classifies genes, uh, if, if it's known, into tumor suppressors, oncogenes, or of um, uncertain or unknown function. Um, you get information about the processes that uh, they're involved in and the kind of mutations that are seen. So for BRCA, most of the mutations are uh, missense, nonsense. Um, for P53, they would mostly be missense. Um, and so tools that we use um, to add all these annotations onto our variants um, include ANOVAR, SNPF. There's also Oncotator. We're going to use ANOVAR in the lab. Um, it's a very popular and widely used tool. So Basically, um, it allows you to do functional annotation of variants in three ways. Gene-based, where you annotate what uh, the effect of the variant is on the protein, uh, which amino acids are affected. It will also consider the different isoforms of the protein. So 
in this spli you know, in this isoform, um, it's going to have this effect. In this is other isoform, which maybe has a different um, combination of exons, it will have a, uh, a different effect, or the uh, mutation will affect a different amino acid. The number will change, but not the actual amino acid. Um, so you can put in whatever gene annotation you want, ensemble gene, UCSC genes, gen code. Um, gen code is um, a good place to start for doing gene annotations. Um, ensemble is also very uh, comprehensive. RevSeq genes are more um, uh, focused on protein coding genes, so a lot of non-coding genes uh, and novel genes, novel predicted genes, would be more in ensemble and gen code rather than RefSeq. So region-based annotations, you know, you could annotate your variants uh, with wh whether they're present in conserved regions of the genome, um, whether they're present in transcription factor binding sites, whether they correspond to GWAS hits, uh, if they're in segmental duplications. Whatever set of annotations you want to use are available, or you can download from UCSC and make into a database, you can go in this region-based or gene-based um, um, annotation. Filter-based, so these are, this is where you'd put dbSNP, 1,000 genomes, and so on. Uh, so there, it's going to predict the mutation effect and impact. Um, and the available databases that you can use to, um, to do all these predictions are here at this link, which is actually a little bit tricky to find if you're just looking online. So uh, I've provided it here. Um, it also has instructions on how you would make your own database if you so desired. Okay. <clears throat> so now that you have this uh, functional annotation, you might filter your list that, uh, to ones that match mutations that match certain criteria, so whether they're coding or predicted to be damaging uh, or in regulatory reasons or splice site mutations or what have you. And then the thing we want to do is turn our, VCF, or our VAFs into, v, uh, into CCFs. So CCF is this idea of cancer cell fraction. So the VAF, the variant allele frequency, is great if you have no, tumor contamination, uh, no normal contamination in your tumor and no copy number events. And so if you, here we have, we see a mutation. I guess the mutational impact here is uh, lightning. So this little red X uh, represents that one of our copies of DNA is mutated, right? So we're going to profile one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of DNA, and three of them will be mutated. So our variant allele fraction is going to be three out of six, so 0.5. So we have a, a fraction of 0.5. This mutation multiplicity is a uh, number. It corresponds to the copies of mutations you have per cell, so that's one. Uh, the ploidy of these cells is 2N, and the purity is 100%. So our cancer, cancer cell fraction is essentially how many cancer cells have this mutation, so 100%. When we have normal contamination, we're still profiling. Uh, in this view, you can see there are still six pieces of DNA that we're profiling. Uh, the purity is 67%, the ploidy is 2N. There's still one copy of the mutation for each cancer cell. Uh, but now, because of this normal contamination, we're only going to detect two out of six uh, reads with a mutation. So that's a variant allele frequency of 0.33%. Um, but the mutation multiplicity is still one. It's still in every cell. So we have to correct um, the VAF to get this cancer cell fraction of one. Uh, so having lower purity pushes the VAF towards the left when we, when we plot VAF on the um, x-axis here. In a normal tumor, what we see... Yeah? Question? <laughs> Yeah, with a mutation. How many of your cancer cells are mutant? So if you're going to, you know, based on this number, the variant allele fraction. So if, if you had perfect conditions, you know, no copy number, no ploidy events, purity was, was 100%, um, your variant allele fraction would kind of uh, correspond to a cancer cell fraction um, in a different way than it would here when you have normal contamination. So you, you can't really use VAFs for um, 
uh, for some of the downstream applications, it's much better to use this cancer cell fraction. It's more informative, right? Knowing that 50% of your cells have a mutation versus 100% of your cells uh, is more important than I picked up this many reads that support my mutation. Um, so the VAF, in a perfect scenario, uh, would look like this, where you have some mutation. So this is a density plot of the VAFs of the mutation in this particular uh, sample, which has an estimated purity of, of close to one. So you see a bunch of mutations that are homozygous. Then you see more mutations that are heterozygous, and there's always some noise in measuring, and so you don't see a, a perfect peak. You see this distribution. And then we see a number of mutations that are subclonal, and this population of mutations that are even more subclonal. Uh, when you have low purity, OK, right, so this is clonal, clonal, uh, homozygous, heterozygous, clonal, and then the subclonal events. When you have low purity, you basically just squash this uh, towards zero. So, you know, you can't use a threshold on VAF for determining what's a clonal mutation because your VAF is 0.2, um, and you, unless you know the purity of your sample and if there are any copy number effect, effects, you might say, ah, oh, yes, that 0.2 is kind of a subclonal event. Uh, but in this tumor, it would actually be a clonal event. Um, so here are a couple of examples where multiplicity is different. Um, so in this case on the left, we have a purity of 67%, uh, a ploidy of 4N. So now, so now ploidy changes how many times we're going to, how much DNA comes from the tumor versus the normal. Uh, the mutation multiplicity is, is three copies per cell. The variant allele fraction is six out of ten, and the cancer cell fraction is one. And here, we again have the same purity, the same ploidy. Um, allelic fraction is going to be one out of ten because there's a mutation just in one cell. Right? So this is going to be a subclonal event. So our cancer cell fraction is going to be 0.5. Um, this multiplicity and CCF tell us something about the timing of mutations. Um, so these are some medulloblastoma tumors where we can see that diploid events um, often have, and medulloblastoma is a pretty pure tumor, so we often have close to 100% purity. Um, so here we can see that diploid and tetraploid events have different mutant allele frequencies. Um, so the VAFs in, uh, in some tumors are typically have a peak that's around 0.25 as opposed to 0.5. And that's because there's often an early uh, genome duplication event, and then lots of mutations are acquired after that event. So you only see it in one of four copies. So you see this preponderance of things at 0.25. Um, and so one can calculate v uh, CCF with this formula, which you probably don't need to know. I just wanted to put it up. Uh, in case you guys are interested, but you have to correct for purity, uh, correct for copy number, uh, the local copy number at that mutation, and the copy number in normal diploid cells, which is always going to be two. Um, so that's kind of how the numbers would work out uh, for this particular scenario. And you would come up with a cancer cell fraction of 0.5. So this is important because uh, you can use the CCF then to infer clonal dynamics, and this is the number that you would use for that for that kind of analysis. So here's an example where a tumor was profiled uh, twice. The first time point was in the primary disease, and the second time point was at recurrence. And basically, some of the mutations in this tumor, which are highlighted here in, re in red, were very rare in the primary. It's this thin strip of red here, and became very prevalent at recurrence. So when you plot the CCF at time point one versus time point two, and you cluster mutations by their CCF, you can find this group of mutations that kind of travel together because they're in the same cells uh, that had a CCF of point one initially, and now are around point eight. Uh, whereas most mutations are clustering up here, um, and were just common to both populations because they happen early and they're in every cell. Um, so CCF is. Uh, what people use to do this kind of analysis and what you turn your VAFs into. Yeah? Can I ask something? Uh, about, Oops. It's about the visualization. But what do you use to create the plot on the left? The plot on the left? Yeah. Oh, that's just an artistic depiction of what likely oh, happens. Exactly. There Now there is a tool to draw these kinds of plots. Um, 
I can send it to you after if you want. Um, often they're difficult to draw because you have information on what mutations and what frequencies, like via the VAF of each uh, mutation in your sample, but you don't know if um, you know one mutation at 10% is on a background of the clone at uh, 40% or the other clone at 40%. So you don't necessarily know where to assign it. So there's enough ambiguity in how you could actually draw this that it's pretty hard to do. So it's hard to do accurately. So always these depictions kind of have the caveat that this is an interpretation of what your tumor structure could look like. There are other tools that will uh, predict the phylogeny of your tumor cells um, based on these frequencies and copy number events. And those are a bit more accurate, but they don't generate this, you know, this, this nice kind of figure. They will generate a tree, a phylogenetic tree. Especially with Yes, the, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, so yeah, so just for the recording, the comment was that you often don't have uh, time point one and time point two, and if you do, you don't have all this stuff in between, so you're just inferring what happens before and in the middle. Um, but that kind of data is becoming uh, more prevalent, and it's being you know, collected by more people. So uh, maybe we'll be able to draw accurate versions of these at some point soon. Um, hmm? Oh, one more question. So can we tell the number of subclones here? The number of subclones yes. from here? Yes. We can tell that there is at least one subclone um, that has uh, gained, uh, that has become very um, uh, overrepresented in the recurrence relative to the primary. Uh, whether the, these mutations occur in the same cells or in two groups of cells um, is not something we can tell from this particular plot. We just know that their frequency was equally low in the primary and now is equally high uh, and correlated in the recurrence. Uh, you would need to do more of a phylogenetic analysis to, to predict lineages. Um, yeah. There's also this clone down here, this little gray one, that was at a decent um, proportion of the primary, which is now pretty much completely absent. So you can see changes in, you know, in the composition of, uh, of the tumor and what mutations are um, segregating in the, in the recurrence versus the primary. Um, and again, this is important because we know now from many studies uh, that the presence of subclonal drivers uh, inversely impacts outcome. So here, anytime it's not black, when it's red or yellow, we have events in these genes are subclonal, as opposed to this co cohort of patients with, uh, where they're all clonal. And when you look at their survival analysis, um, you can see that, uh, that having a subclonal driver is much worse for prognosis. Okay, so um, a few more slides. Um, the effect of purity and ploidy on the power to detect somatic SNVs. So I want to start kind of, I think, in the middle plot. Um, so this, these, are, these lines are, in the middle, are your detection power for a particular mutation given sequencing coverage. And this green dot on the line, which is the, um, this delta, is essentially the frequency of your mutation. Um, and you can get a frequency of 0 0.125, so 12.5%. 12, 12 um, this is using absolutes, right? So it tries to fit a purity and copy number um, that will give you that particular observed frequency. So in this case, we have a, a tumor with a purity of about 50% uh, and a copy number of about 6. So that's going, so a clonal event in such a tumor will show up at a frequency of 12 0.5% in your reads. So you have a power to detect this event with about, you need about 33 reads. So a typical whole genome sequencing uh, experiment will give you a 30x coverage. Um, so for this kind of tumor, that would just give you enough power to detect a clonal event because of the amount of normal contamination present. So if you have more normal contamination, you lose power to detect events. 
Um, if your mutation is subclonal, then to have an 80% power of detecting such an event, you would need about 300x coverage, right? So here we're, you know, in the realm of WGS, and here we're in the realm of whole exome sequencing, and then here you would be uh, in much deeper sequencing uh, than you typically get from a whole exome sequencing. So purity and copy number or ploidy really affects um, this is kind of the, the relationship between that and the power to detect variants. Can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess this means that if we just determine the line, then sequence match length. Is that true? The match line. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in the case of the tumor, you sequence deeply because your method is kind of intense, right? Yeah. Uh, and also the but would you know in your tumor sample if the event was germline or not? I guess you would compare it to your actual germline. So you're saying how low can you go in terms of coverage for the germline if you have all this normal contamination? Um, some, a big u utility in having a germline with decent coverage is that you can exclude artifacts that are going to be observed at a specific coverage. So uh, people have done comparisons of deeply sequenced tumors and deeply sequenced germlines and then started to reduce uh, the amount of uh, coverage in the germline to see if you can still pick up and um, accurately find your somatic events. And after a certain point, uh, if your coverage isn't enough in the germline, you start to have lots of false positives. Um, so I think you'd so there, there is usefulness in sequencing your germline to kind of a comparable. The best is to have a comparable depth to your actual uh, experiment. But in practice, uh, you know, don't do like less than two thirds of your coverage. Um, it, I know people. It's expensive to do sequencing, and it's attractive to to do low coverage. But it really does help you to eliminate false positives. Mm. So by trying to go cheaper on one, you're just wasting the other one. You don't have the sort of confidence. And you don't really save anything because you have to always do it. You pay for the extra sequence for the high cover sample, but then you get the data quality of the low quality sample. So. <laughs> Yeah, so just for the recording, the comment was for ChIP-seq data, where you have, if you have a high coverage tumor sample and a low coverage uh, control, so input, um, then some tools will downsample the higher coverage uh, sequencing run so that you have a, a equally comparable uh, data sets and then you're just wasting your sequencing. So something to consider. Yeah? Yes, people do look for non-coding events uh, associated with cancer, so like the TERT mutations, but also, you know, if you have, it, it depends what you're annotating your variants with. So if you're interested in non-coding variants, uh, don't use RefSeq to annotate your variant list. Use GenCode, and then you'll have all the, um, you know, link RNAs and small non-coding RNAs and all the non-coding uh, um, you know, annotations in, in the genome. Um, if you want to do prediction uh, of novel non-coding things, you would need to use RNA-seq data, right? Um, and if you want to look for non-polyadenylated um, transcripts, you would need to sequence in a specific way, right? Because you can't do poly-T selection. So it depends how your experimental setup is for, and you know, what your interest is in, in finding non-coding driver events. Because they could be just a, um, an expression difference, right? Not necessarily a mutation. So in the non-coding um, uh, transcript, uh, mutation is going to be silent by default because it's not coding. Although some of these non-coding RNAs are shown to have now a small open reading frame. Um, so that's still, I guess, an area of active investigation. But... If you see recurrent mutations in a non-coding um, uh, gene, that would be of interest and you should follow up probably. <laughs>
but regulatory elements are the other big category to look at. Yeah? On these graphs, do, do you know if um, the graphs continue to look the same, like at an order of magnitude greater sequencing <laughs> depth, so you can like use sequencing depth to push, push past any purification? Um, I don't know that, how these particular graphs look when you go uh, further to the right. Uh, but, you know, your so this is why deep sequencing and amplicon sequencing studies uh, exist, right? To find these really rare events that you're not necessarily powered to find using 30x or even 200x. Um, so, you know, in previous work, we've done amplicon sequencing and had, you know, an average of 10,000 reads coverage for a particular position. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for uh, clonal events in the recurrence and if we could find them at all in the primary uh, tumor. So we could find these really rare events with that level of coverage. Um, this was in medulloblastoma, which like I said, has really good purity. Um, so if you were also suffering from low purity, uh, your power would basically be proportional to, uh, um, to the coverage. So it kind of depends on what your question is and if you're taking a targeted approach or, um, or, or what your approach is. Um, but for this particular uh, data, I don't know what the curves look like on the right. But I assume that they would converge at one point, right? With enough coverage, you would find everything, except you would still have false positives, uh, which would correspond to those uh, rare uh, PCR mutations or, um, or other mutations that, that are going to be artifacts of the technique you're using. So at some point, with rare enough variants, you won't be able to distinguish them from the sequencing or PCR-induced artifacts. So if you're going to go really deep, you need to use a really uh, um, accurate polymerase. OK, so now that we have these cancer cell fractions, we can see uh, or determine which mutations are clonal versus subclonal. So now people do various types of analyses that would be specific to your experimental setup and uh, what you hope to learn from your experiment. So you could do a recurrence or a significance analysis uh, to find which mutations are more likely to be drivers because they're observed more than you would expect by chance. Um, you could look for patterns of clonal evolutions like we, like we saw in the last slide. Uh, you could try to look for mutational mechanisms. Um, or you could associate your mutations with clinical variables, so like sub subtype survival, metastasis, and so on. Um, frequency in the population is one of the things that's um, really um, broadly used to interpret uh, the importance of mutations. Um, so, you know, Titan is a huge gene. It's going to come up and you'll find mutations in Titan, no matter what you sequence almost. Um, and so you need to normalize for gene length, for in instance, in order to determine if the frequency of observed events is more than you would expect by chance. <clears throat> so there are various tools like uh, this tool, Music, or MuteSigCV, uh, or other tools that would take various or account for various properties of genes um, that would affect the mutation count, so like length of gene. Um, also, mutation rates are turn out to be lower in genes that are highly expressed uh, in normal cells because there's the, this process called transcription-coupled repair. Um, so in highly transcribed genes, you have lower mutation rates than in, lower, uh, in genes that are more uh, infrequently transcribed. Um, the replication timing... Um, of, the, of a DNA region is also important. So genes that are replicated uh, late have higher mutation rates. So genes that are replicated early uh, can be easily repaired, more easily repaired than ones that are replicated late. And one hypothesis for what, why this might happen is that uh, by that point in the process, there is a less available pool of free nucleotides. And so when a repair needs to get done, you only have so much time to do it. And so if you don't have an available T or whatever base uh, is needed to go in the repair, then you have a l less uh, chance to repair that accurately. So these are some of the things that uh, you would need to account for in interpreting whether the frequency of your, ob uh, your observed mutation in the population is more than you would expect by chance uh, or not. Um, like I said, we, we can do this clonal evolution kind of analysis. So this is 
this is an interesting uh, paper where they looked at uh, kidney cancer and they profiled the primary tumor as well as multiple metastatic sites. Um, and we are seeing here in gray are the mutations and black is lack of mutations. Um, and so we see that in all these different regions of the tumor, there are a lot of mutations that are in shared and then some that are specific to different metastases. But interestingly, when you do a phylogenetic analysis of these mutations, you can see that some things are consistently uh, mutated, like SETD2 is recurrently mutated. Uh, and it's different mutations in different parts of the tumors. P10 is recurrently mutated in different parts of the tumors. So there seems to be a dependence of, um, like a biological dependence on certain pathways um, for the growth of this tumor. So this type of convergence in mutational events between different regions really tells you something about the biology of tumors. So these kinds of studies are really powerful for, for analyzing uh, a clonal evolution. Uh, we already talked about mutational profiles, uh, and you guys will have a chance to do that in the lab. Um, and then just a last slide, <clears throat> um, which really describes kind of the other important aspect for testing of functionality of mutations. So you're going to have these predictions. You'll have some mutation you're uh, really fond of or you think is, a, is the key to your tumor. You have to validate it, right? Uh, before you validate it, if you have expression data, you could do this type of analysis where <clears throat> where you look at the impact of mutation across the pathway that it's involved in. Um, so this particular study um, looked at uterine cancer in TCGA data. So all these cases of uterine cancer, which are all the columns, have a mutation in beta-catenin, uh, so CTNNB1, um, which is this track right here. So these are all mutant tumors. So a mutation in this gene is known to activate the wind signaling pathway. Um, and the rows here are the, the genes involved in this pathway. So red and blue indicate activation and suppression of genes in this pathway. Um, and so we know that these mutations, for instance, are active because they're altering um, the transcriptional output of this pathway. Um, but it turns out that there are some cases with mutation which don't activate the pathway. And so when you look at this additional uh, row, pol E, so pol E uh, mutant tumors are hypermutated. So they often carry mutations in many, many genes, and a lot of them are going to be passengers. So a lot of these um, mutant CTNNB1 uh, cases that don't have pathway activations are these hypermutant tumors. So these are actually passenger events in those tumors. Something else is driving those tumors. And so even though they contain a mutation, it's not functional. Uh, so it's not just a matter of finding the frequency or over-representation of your mutation, uh, but there are other analyses like this that you can do to then infer the activity uh, of your mutation in, in that particular sample. Um, okay, so I think we'll end there. And we'll look